Good morning. Welcome to Broadway Baptist Church. We were just laughing at Ella. She's got the first song, and she's down there talking. I guess this boy that she likes, uh, I don't know, maybe that's a thing. Thank you so much for being with us. Stand up and join us. We're going to sing today. Chain breaker. 
I'll search for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. When there's a better life, there's a better life. Somebody testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify sounds so good this morning singing. Um, I never know or I haven't known when I uh, filled in before what Brother Kevin is going to be preaching on on a particular Sunday. But I think it's amazing that the sermon today is about prayer. One of the questions he asked is, how's your prayer life? And I don't know about you, but I remember the first time I ever prayed in public and how nervous I was. And my hands would sweat. Did I say the right things? And I heard an example on the radio this week about an older gentleman who got saved and he was in a assisted living facility and uh, he asked one day one of the attendants was in the room and he said I don't know how to pray and she said oh honey she just pulled up a chair beside his bed I said just talk to him just imagine Jesus is sitting right here and talk to him and he began to do that and over time would talk to an empty chair. People might think it's a little bit crazy, but he was talking to God. And when he passed, they found him and his head lay over on that chair, on the arm of that chair, I should say. That's what we're going to be talking about today in our worship. What's your prayer life? Do you talk to him? Do you talk to him? Or you just tell him about life? It doesn't have to be anything special. It doesn't have to be anything perfect or anything scripted. Just giving your heart and sharing your heart with the Lord, developing that relationship. You be thinking about that today as we enter into our time of worship. God of everlasting wonder, you hold everything together. You have been and you will always be. of heaven and earth nothing could contain your splendor you have been and you will always be so I will never be afraid for you are with me I'll trust in you for all my i 
You may be seated. I just want her to share with you a little bit about what's going on in Vacation Bible School. I remember it's a big thing going on here at Broadway Baptist Church, and we're so glad that you're leading it. Thank you. Before I even explain to you what I was going on, I have to say a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous thank you to all the adults that have been participating. We've changed things up on you a little bit this year, but you've just gone with the flow, and we've had an awesome time. We had, I believe it was 49 students the first night, first night, 64 this last night, and we want to give you a special invitation to join us this Wednesday night. Our drop-off is at 515, and we uh, work with the children until 730, so you have a special in invitation to join us. It's now time for Children's Church. If you have a child between the ages of four and second grade and would like for them to attend, just have them meet at the middle door and remember at the end of the service to go down the stairs to sign them out. David challenged us with prayer earlier. I don't necessarily think you need to talk out loud right now to God, but I would just for a moment, just quietly where you are, um, just pray. Uh, some of you guys maybe have never done that or, or, you know, it may seem kind of odd to in the middle of a worship service pray, but just take a moment or two and uh, talk to God like he was sitting in the seat next to you. Tell him about your day, tell him about your worries, your struggles, your stresses. 
tell him about your blessings and just spend a couple moments, if you would, uh, talking with him today. God, as we uh, have been in worship, as we continue in worship, Lord, help us to clearly see what it is. It's our chance. It's our time to come, to communicate, to have fellowship with you. And that's what draws us here, God. It's not the people around us or the building or anything like that. It's you. It's the relationship that we have, that we desire with you, that brings us in here every week, every time we come to this time of corporate worship. It's to come into fellowship with you. Lord, to talk, to tell you about our week, our life, how things are going, the goods, the bads, the ups and the downs. So Father, as we continue to worship you this morning, Continue the conversation with us. God, as we read scripture and as we think things as we read it, Lord, help us just to communicate that with you as we read scripture and, and all of a sudden it sinks in or it dawns on us in a new way. God, help us just to be obedient, to follow that. Lord, we ask that you continue to just move in our lives in this service. God, that we would continue the conversation with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you with us this morning. Must not be many of you here this morning. You could cut the lights on for us. That would help us a little bit. All right. This morning, I want to uh, talk with you a little bit further about uh, the discipline of worship. Uh, but before I do, uh, let me just remind you, a couple of months ago, we uh, uh, started a new campaign, uh, Reaching New Heights, and several things will be involved in that. Uh, but one of the things will be an elevator. Uh, that we hope to get under construction. Uh, some weeks ago, I had an opportunity to talk with the guy that will be doing our construction, and he still hopes that he'll get started sometime in the middle of uh, August, and so we are uh, in great anticipation of that time, and so uh, we look forward to that. But not only are we going to want you to make sacrifices in your giving, uh, but and we hope that you do, uh, but we also need you to make some sacrifices in many areas. Uh, we are trying to get back in full swing after the pandemic, and uh, we uh, still uh, have some areas that we are trying to get uh, cranked back off as a church. Uh, Sunday school, we are hoping that uh, we are getting more and more of our Sunday school classes started back. If you are not part of one, uh, we'd like to invite you to come and try one out. We have several and give you an opportunity to try several of them. But also, uh, we are in some need of some help uh, in trying to get our nursery cranked back off. Uh, we have uh, nursery during this service, and we have had for some time. Uh, but we're beginning to sense the need of uh, nursery in our earlier service. And this is an area where we really need some workers. Now I realize you're coming to church at this particular time. Uh, and it's asking a lot of you to come early and uh, keep the nursery. And, uh, but uh, we would love for you to help us in that regard. Uh, some of you are at the age where you're beginning to wonder, am I ever going to have grandchildren? Well, we can't answer that question for you. Uh, but we can give you a little bit of a time to practice and uh, keeping some children in our nursery and uh, just see what that's going to be like. And you say, well, them kids that come to church, they're bad kids. Yes, they are, and uh, so will your grandkids be. Uh, let me just go ahead and tell you, 
Uh, we had a uh, sailor spend the night with us last night. And Terry's always told you last Sunday how much our my wife worships her grandchildren. Uh, well, last night was not such a worshipful experience at, uh, all through the night, but she really did love it. And, uh, uh, well, just we need some help in our nursery. So hope that you'll uh, help us in that regard. I want to continue this morning uh, the message that I started last week, the discipline of worship. This morning is part two of that. And uh, I want to just go back, if you would, to the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 24. In Genesis chapter 24, we find where the people of God are just getting their start. They really are in the promise stage at this particular point. Genesis 24 tells the story of how Abraham was getting very old. Matter of fact, it tells us twice that he was getting old. It says that he was now old, and then it says he was well advanced in years. And that's a way to try to emphasize that he realizes that the clock is beginning to run out on him. But he acknowledges that the Lord had blessed him in every way. So he called his chief servant in his household, the one who was in charge of all that he had. He called him in, and he gave him these instructions. He says, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that uh, you will not get a wife for my son from the daughter of the Canaanites among the whom I'm living. But you'll go back to my country, to my relatives, and you'll get a wife for my son Isaac. Now, putting the hand under the thigh was a way of striking a covenant between two individuals. And really, this is a huge challenge for Abraham's servant. But he knows he needs to get a wife for his son Isaac. He doesn't want to get one from the people living around him because he's living among the Canaanites. And they're a very pagan, a very uh, wicked kind of people. Uh, and, and Abraham knows he needs to get someone from his own household, his own family lineage, and he needs to get someone from those people rather than the people in the area in which he's living. And so the servant takes the great challenge. And by the way, this really is a huge challenge for the servant. And uh, I drop down to verse number 12. But in between, the servant actually asked Abraham, now, what do I do if I get there and nobody's willing to come back with me? And he says, well, you'll be free from the covenant we've made here today, but I at least need you to try. We pick it the story back up in verse number 12. Now he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today. Show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside the spring, and the daughters of the town people are coming to draw water. May it be when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may get a drink. And she says to me, drink, and I'll carry water to your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now notice, she prays. Not only does she pray, but he gets very specific in the prayer. And this particular day in history, women carried water pots on their shoulder. And as he's, they're going out to the well, he prays, says, Lord, when a woman comes by and I ask her, would she give me a drink? Not only will she let this huge water pot down, give me a drink of water, but she'll also water all of my camels. Calvin Miller, who was a professor at Beeson Divinity School, said that her pray, his prayer really was this. Lord, let her be kind and give me a drink of water and let her have a deep love for camels. You've heard the story of how much water a camel can hold and all of this and how many camels there would have been that day. She's committing herself to carry a whole lot of water for all of these camels. But the uh, Abraham's servant is very specific in the prayer that he prayed. Then verse 15, before he had finished praying, he bows his head and prays, and he makes a very specific prayer to God. And then before he finished praying, 
Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, uh, who was the wife of Abraham's brother. And the girl was beautiful. She was a virgin. No man had ever been with her. Now, he prays a very specific prayer. And before he had finished praying, he looks up and there is Rebecca. And she was dazzling. She was beautiful. She was everything that he had prayed for. And so he begins to just think, this has got to be from God. It leads me to ask you this question. How is your prayer life? On a scale of 1 to 10, would you give yourself a 10? On a scale of how your prayer life has been in the past... How is your prayer life today? Are you praying more fervently today than you ever have in your life? Are you praying less than you less now than you did a year ago? Or has the pandemic affected your prayer life? Have you somewhat given up on just talking to God? David told the story about a person who began to talk to an empty chair just to remind themselves that they are talking to an individual. And it got to be such a part of their lives that when they died, they actually leaned their head over on the chair as they were dying. Let me ask you, how is your, your prayer life? Abraham's servant had been given a great challenge, and all of us are, uh, from time to time, will have challenges in our life. And when the challenges of life come, you need to understand they're going to happen in all of our lives. And I don't know where you are. Some of you are on the front end of some of the greatest challenges of your life. Now, I know the pandemic is beginning to sort of move into history, although we're not completely past the pandemic at this time. But we are better as situated in the pandemic than we were this time last year. So you may be on the front end of a new challenge. Or maybe you find yourself today right in the middle of a challenge. My question to you is, how is your prayer life, whether you're on the front end or whether you're on the, in the middle of a challenge? Or it may be that you're on the other side of whatever challenge you are finding in your life. Did that challenge enhance your prayer life? Did it cause your prayer life to sort of cease? Did you get frustrated because God wasn't doing exactly what you wanted him to do? And you got to the point where you just give up a little bit on praying. I mean, you say the prayers, you pray before you have your meals, and you pray before you go to bed, or you pray when you first get up. But what I'm asking you this morning is how is your prayer life as far as really having a connection conversation with God? I don't talk a whole bunch. When I get home in the afternoon, a lot of times I'll just sit quietly around the house. And We were sitting there the other night and hadn't said anything to Terry, and she hadn't really said anything to me. And finally she looked over at me and she said, You love me? And I said, Yeah. She said, Well, sometimes you need to show me. And what she meant was sometimes I just need to have conversation with her. That's what prayer really is, is having a connecting conversation with God. It's one of the ways that we express our love to him. Look, if you would, at what Donald S. Whitley says in his book. Prayer expresses our worshipful devotion to God, and our worshipful devotion to, and our dependence on God. So let me ask you, how is your worshipful devotion to God are you taking time to talk with him are you having any conversation with him at all through the day and if so is it just kind of a bow your head Lord bless the food or uh, Lord thank you for the day or thank you for seeing me through this day do you ever just really have these worshipful devotional conversations with God where you really are expressing your love to him. Not only does he talk about worshipful devotion, but he talks about dependence on God. 
When I look at uh, Genesis 24, uh, really and truly, I see a chapter that deals with prayer. I'm amazed as I read through commentaries and read articles about Genesis 24. Not a whole lot of people talk about the prayer, but when I read this, I'm always captivated by the fact that this guy prays to God, and then before he finishes praying, God is already at work answering that prayer. This is a passage that speaks about a tremendous dependence upon God. I'm one of those people who would tell you that what we see happening in Genesis 4 is an experience that really could not have happened if it were not for God working in his life the way that he did. A prayerful expression of our worshipful devotion and dependence to God. Look if you would uh, at, well, the challenges of life. You're either on the front end the middle, or you're coming out on the other side. Well, let's, uh, let's continue with our, our passage. Genesis 24, verse 20, 22. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. And then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Well, she's a gracious host. She answered, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, more of uh, uh, Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder, as, as well as uh, a room for you to spend the night. And the man lowered down, or bowed down, and he worshiped the Lord. After seeing what he sees, after experiencing this moment of prayerfulness, And seeing God work in his life, the thing that he does is he bows down and he worships God. Let me ask once again, how is your prayer life? Did you pray for our service this morning before you came to church? Uh, Let me make a personal request. As you come to church and as you're on your way, pray for me. I I still have challenges as I stand and speak before you Sunday after Sunday. And and I really do need your prayers. And believe it or not, your prayers really do enhance the service. Not only pray for me as I speak before people, but also pray for our music and those that are involved in our music. Pray that God will use our music. Pray that God will use it in your life. Pray that God will use it in someone else's life. Pray for our services. This man experienced a great move of God in the midst of his prayer life. And when he saw what God was doing, he bowed down and he worshiped God. Let me just say to you that as you really get engaged with God in prayer, it will not only enhance your prayer life, but it will also enhance your worship experience and I believe it will enhance the worship experience of others that gather and worship with us. Let's continue reading. This is how he praised God. This is how he worshiped God. Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who's not abandoned his kindness and his faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on my journey to the house of my master's relatives all the places he could have gone he wound up right with the very family that Abraham had told him to go to he says as for me God has led me in my journey he's led me to the very place that I need to go and remember before he'd even got through praying Rebecca was standing right there in front of him and when he looked up she was dazzling she was beautiful and she was just the kind of young lady that he was looking for, for Isaac. And so he bows his head and he worships God. Marvin Tate, who writes an article in the Holman Bible Dictionary, defines worship like this. It is the human response to perceived presence of the divine, a present which transcends normal human activity and is holy. When I read that definition, I couldn't help but to think, 
that this, that actually defines what you read here in Genesis 24. There is no way this could have worked out the way it did unless God was involved in it. And this is exactly why Abraham's servant bows and he worshiped God. Because he prayed and then God answered his prayer. Folks, I hope that you are seeing this kind of thing in your life. I hope you're praying for specifically for particular things to happen. And then I hope that you are seeing God answer those prayers in a specific way. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Last Sunday I talked with you about how easy it is for Satan to come into our life and to tempt us to begin worshiping and serving anything except God. And, God and, and he does. Satan is always at work trying to guide us off in the wrong direction. It made me think about uh, John Piper in his book, Future Grace. John Piper in that book says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Well, I've asked you, how's your prayer life? Let me ask you how satisfied you are with God. You ever get disappointed with God? You ever think, well, maybe I need to try something else, try something a little different? I like what Piper says. It may be a little hard for us to digest, but he's saying that God is most satisfied in us, most glorified in us, when we are most satisfied in him. And then notice how he defines sin. Sin is what you do when your heart is not satisfied with God. He lists several things, and I started to put all of these things up on the board, but I decided I would just focus on maybe just one. He said impatience is where we get tired of God's timing, and we try to push for our own timing over God's timing. And if we could ask anybody in the Bible about that, it would be Abraham. Abraham was one who got tired of waiting for God to bring about the promise that he had made to him. And so he let his wife talk him into trying another method. And they actually gave birth to a son by the name of Ishmael through his handmaid, Hagar. And, by the way, the decision that Abraham made to try to fix this thing himself rather than wait on God, our world is still dealing with the issue that that has brought into our world even to this particular day. And by the way, when you get dissatisfied with God, when you try to fix things in your own way, that not only affects your life, and sometimes it fixes, uh, th sets things in motion in your life where you'll have to live with that decision for the rest of your life. Not only does it affect your life in profound ways, but sometimes it can affect others' lives around you. So, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And sin, that's what you do when your heart is not satisfied with God. Well, let's look, if you would, at Romans chapter 6, verse number 13. Paul says, do not offer parts of your body to sin, an instrument of wickedness, rather Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Do you ever think about the parts of your body that you're offering to various services, various means of, uh, of, of are you offering it to God or offering it to, to all kinds of wickedness? Look at uh, what Paul says in Ephesians. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his very own hands, a part of the body. And what Paul is saying is you can use your hand to steal, or you can use your hand as something that can be used for God's glory. And that's what he's saying. He's, he who has been stealing needs to stop. Stop stealing but rather work, doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those who are in need. You can use your hands to help other people or you can use your hands in ways 
that are sinful. Look what Job says. Job says, I made a covenant with my very own eyes. And the covenant was, I'm not going to look lustfully at a girl. We could talk about lust. We could talk about lusting after a girl. But many of us have other problems when it comes to our eyes and the issue of lust. Do you ever allow, allow your eyes to cause you to lust after what other people have? Maybe you lust after the home they live in. Maybe you lust after the kind of car that they are driving. I told us in the early service, when Luke was in the second grade, he came home from school one day and he said, Dad, you know those shoes? And he described the little shoes. My wife has told me a thousand times what the name of the shoe is and I never can remember. But she said, he said, it's got a little green tag on the side of it. Well, I was in Walmart a few days later and I saw a pair of shoes exactly like he was describing and it had a little green tag on it. So I got him them shoes and man, I thought we were set. He was going to go to school happy. Well, about two days later, I picked him up from school and we were on the way home. He said, Dad, next time we get a pair of these shoes, uh, it's got the little green tag on the side. Can it say B-A-S-S? -S? And I thought, oh Lord, he's been bitten by the very thing that Job is talking about. Can I tell you something? Our whole American culture is built on this idea. Our economy is driven because people want what they see with other people. And it starts in school. We see somebody that's got a particular kind of clothes or a particular kind of shoes. Or they're, they're doing this or they're doing the other. And suddenly we decide we want to do that very same thing. We're looking lustfully into the lives of other people. Paul is saying, look, don't offer the parts of your body, whether it's your hand, your eyes, your mind. Sometimes our mouths can be used as an instrument of wickedness rather than an instrument of righteousness. Now, I know it never happens with this group, but have you ever heard anybody saying stuff that really just cuts other people down. Sometimes we say stuff, and sometimes it's even true, but it just shouldn't be said. Well, folks, I want to tell you, we don't need to allow Satan to cause us to use parts of our body, whether it's our hand, our eyes, our mind, our mouth, whatever part of the body you want to talk about, use them as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather use them for something that is good. Look at what Paul concludes in Romans 12. I urge you therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. And then he qualifies it. Holy, pleasing to God. Do you ever go through the day and just stop and think, am I using my body in ways that are holy and pleasing to God. Rick Warren says the problem with this verse is that word there where it says living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice is its ability to crawl off of the altar. But this is what Paul is saying to do. Take our lives, our lives, and lay them before God as a living sacrifice. God, I want my life to be holy I want my life, the things that I do with the parts of my body, my hand, my eyes, my brain, my mouth, every part of my body, I want it to be used for that which is holy, that which is pleasing to God. And then the NIV uses this expression at the end of that verse. Look if you would. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do you realize every day of your life, the way you conduct yourself with others really is an act of worship before God? How you use your hand, your mind, your eyes, your mouth, all parts of your body, how you use them really are acts of worship to God. Look, if you would, at this expression, 1 Kings chapter 8. This was in my daily Bible reading for this week, and 
when I read it, I thought, man, I've got to read that Sunday morning, and I hope that you'll spend some time just reflecting on this verse and maybe letting it lead you into a time of meaningful, worshipful prayer. When Abraham's servant saw what God was doing, he praised God. This is a great place to praise God. Abraham praying over the dedication of the temple. I'm not Abraham, Solomon. Solomon praying over the dedication of the temple. He said, O Lord God, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You keep your covenant of love and your, uh, with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. Do you ever just really stop and think, there is no God like our God? God in heaven, God on this earth. I mean, there's nothing compares with the greatness of our God. I hope that all of this will help you as you really discipline yourself to spend time worshiping God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for each person that is a part of this worship experience. And Lord, I pray today that you'll help us to really enter into these times of worship with our hearts set on worshiping you. Help us to give time into praying about our worship service. Praying for me as one that will do the speaking and the, all of those that will be a part of our singing, those that will lead in prayer. Father, I pray that you'll help us to pray for our services and may we see your hand at work in the things we do during this time of worship. Father, I pray for those that may be here this morning that have never trusted Christ. And Lord, I pray today that they might understand that they really, truly can't worship you until they have a personal relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's one here today that has never opened their heart and received not only Jesus as their Lord, but also the forgiveness of their sin. And Father, I pray today if there's one here that they might come this morning, open their heart, and trust Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. Bless this time of invitation, we pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together as we sing this morning as we join in this time of uh, invitation. If there's a decision on your heart, whatever God would have you to do, you come. I'll meet you right here at the front. <coughs> Your faithfulness is walked beside me. The winter storms make way for spring. In every season, from the wind.
Thank you guys for joining us for worship today. I'm glad each of you all is here. Um, and so thank you guys for being a part of our worship service. I hope that you remember those words and that you realize that worship does not stop now. It continues as you leave here and as you go home. Uh, throughout the rest of your week, you are continuing to worship God with the way that you live. And so um, thank you for being here today. Uh, a couple things I'm supposed to tell you guys. Nominating committee, if you're on it, you have a meeting today at 4 o'clock upstairs. I'm guessing that means over there upstairs in the Faith Chapel. Uh, deacons, you have magazines for you in the foyer in the lobby right out here. And then also, oh, on the information table. Who moved them? I don't know. Uh, anyways, um, there's a speaker there. They're right here on the information table, so you don't even have to go to the lobby. You can go right there. And then also, uh, deacon nomination form is in your bulletin, so uh, if you have not filled that out, today is the last day to do that. We need the, your deacon nominations um, by the end of today. You can put them in either the offering boxes in either side of the sanctuary. Uh, walk through Bethlehem coordinator meeting today at 5 o'clock downstairs in the new fellowship hall. And uh, I know we haven't said anything about Bethlehem in a little while, but uh, it's coming, it's going to be awesome, and I hope that you're thinking of a way that you can be involved in it this year, because let me just tell you, uh, I'm really excited about what God's going to do uh, through that this year already, and it's, I know, it's July, or June, and I'm thinking about Christmas, like, it's kind of scary, I don't like that, but um, anyways, thank you guys for being here today, I love you, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>